All right. Um, I think we're looking good to get started. Awesome. Cool. Welcome everybody to this webinar. Um, I'm really excited for the topics we'll be getting into um, in just a moment with our wonderful panelists. The name of the webinar is Environmental Injustice, Combating Threat to Land Defenders, and we'll be discussing the question, why do governments and gangs alike target land defenders and what can we do to fight back? Um, my name's Teddy Ogborn. I am Code Pink's Wing, War is Not Green campaign coordinator, focusing on the intersections of militarism, both domestic and international, and the climate crisis and environmental injustice. Um, I'm joined also by uh, Code Pink Latin America coordinator, uh, Latin America campaign coordinator. Um, Samantha, would you like to introduce yourself as well? Sure. Hi, everyone. Um, and thanks, Teddy, and to all of our panelists, to Priscilla, to Matthew, um, for being here, and to um, everyone who's joining us now. I'm also really excited to be on this um, webinar with Briseida, who is an amazing uh, human rights defender, land defender, um, just a strong um, Colombian um, land defender who has uh, received many threats due to her activism and her work. Thank you, Samantha. Um, so, for today's webinar, we'll go ahead and start with some introductions from our panelists. They'll speak to the importance of their work doing land defense um, in the regions where, where they are um, work as activists. Um, with increasing militarism and fascism globally, this is an incredibly important topic to study and understand because as the material um, realities of farmers, agricultural workers, um, peasants, or people that depend on nature and trees to live, which is all of us, is continually threatened. We must rise up and we must defend this land. Um, so first, uh, I'd like to introduce Matthew Johnson. Um, Matthew Johnson is a supporter of actions, lead meditations and yoga in the forest, and recently started a series of forums so people are better informed issues at hand there in Atlanta. Matthew, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me, Teddy. Um, it's a pleasure to be here and it's always good to know that people want to know more about this struggle. Uh, what we're seeing in Atlanta is the confluence of so many of the major issues that will be affecting us for the years to come. We're looking at environmental degradation, clear examples of environmental racism, as well as police violence uh, and the implications of racism uh, that are always involved there in anti-Blackness especially. Uh, what we're looking at is the destruction of the largest forest in any major urban area in America to replace it with the largest militarized police training facility in North America. And this is all being done in a black neighborhood that already has five detention facilities in the neighborhood in addition to a landfill. So essentially uh, this space is being used as the refuge of uh, essentially the bowels of capitalism and uh, racialized capitalism in this black neighborhood where there's already issues with flooding and poisoned water. Uh, another thing that has been a part of our fight uh, has been uh, having the Clean Water Act by the EPA and force. Uh, this is fairly unprecedented that you have a legislation by the EPA that has no deadline or enforcement attached to it. So this particular part of the uh, river, the South River, where there are 400,000 black residents, and every time that it rains more than a 10th of an inch, the Atlanta and DeKalb sewage system overflows into the water supply. And our, there's already uh, more sediment uh, than is supposed to be in the daily flow of the water. There's no, deadline for enforcement to clean it. However, where you have a place that is white and affluent just up the river, uh, you see enforcement where this has to be cleaned by 2027. 
where it's 76% black, there's absolutely no enforcement. So let alone all the issues of police violence, we also like to highlight these issues that really have knock on effects for everybody. And this only happens in these black areas. Uh, I don't wanna go over my time right now. Uh, and I'm sure that we'll get to more details later. Thank you so much, Matthew. Looking forward to hearing some more about your work and thank you so much for, for sharing that introduction now. Um, next, I'd like to bring up uh, Briseida Lemos Rivera. She is a woman, mother, peasant, farmer, and social leader from the municipality of Miranda, Norte del Cauca. She is a member of the National Single Agricultural Trade Union Federation, or FENSWAGRO, and the Pro-Constitution uh, Pro Association of the Peasant Reserve Zone of Miranda, or ASPERSONAC. And La Finca de Oliveira, where, among other leaderships, she plays a fundamental role in the promotion and creation of the Peasant University in Finca de Oliveira. In addition, she works tirelessly for the implementation of the 2016 Peace Accord, is part of the Planning Commission, the Victims Table, and is part of the Development Plan with a Territorial Approach, or PDET, of the Municipality of Miranda. Briseida, thank you so much for joining us. And for our listeners, we'll be interpreting uh, Briseida's responses from Spanish to English. Gracias. Gracias. Gracias a thank ustedes. You. Thank you, guys. Eh, bueno, mi nombre es Briseida. My name is Briseida. Eh, Demo Rivera. Demo Rivera. Mujer madre. I am a mother, head of household, of four children, two boys and two girls. I'm a Fuenzuagrista woman from Northern Cauca and I'm part of the victims movement. I'm a woman from Asopronac, a movement from Miranda Cauca. I'm a very activist woman. I'm involved in human rights struggles. And I think we need to promote education, something that has been denied to us in our country. Accessing education has been one of our greatest struggles in our country. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Briseida, for being here and for joining us. Um, so, um, now we, we, we're going to jump into a few questions um, uh, just to get the conversation started. Um, after these questions, we'll open up for an audience Q&A. Um, of course, this is a discussion, so Briseida Matthew um, or any one of the panelists here, if, um, if something comes up for you that you'd like to ask some more about or to clarify, please go right ahead. Um, I want to start with a rather broad question, but a really important one to um, begin this discussion, uh, which is why, why is environmental work increasingly being criminalized? Why is environmental work increasingly being criminalized? Um, Matthew, maybe we can start with you. Yes, a couple things to note. Uh, right now, in our struggle in Atlanta, uh, over, la pregunta, Barbara? over the past uh, two months, bueno. we've had 19 people arrested for domestic terrorism and uh, one of our friends murdered in the forest. Uh, these charges are being put forward indiscriminately. Uh, everybody who just happened to be in the woods one particular day, people that were pepper sprayed, shot with rubber bullets and forcibly taken out of trees. Uh, people that just happened to be at the wrong protest and got swooped up by the police indiscriminately are being charged with domestic terrorism with no grounds. Uh, this is 2023 in the state of uh, Georgia and the United States. But what we are seeing is final breaths of the global capitalist system. Uh, I, this is this is dystopian. It seems like this would be out of a science fiction novel, but here we are, where people are fighting to make sure that they are protecting the last major forest uh, in this urban area that stops Atlanta from having a lot of the deleterious effects of other places that have comparable daily commutes. 
Um, but this gets in the way of profits for what? And then state uh, the expansion of state violence for two. Let me explain. So in Atlanta, uh, there are two fights happening in the forest at the same time. Stop Cup City, a lot of people know about, but then there was also a part that's called Stop the Swap. And this is where uh, someone named Ryan Millsap was aiming to build the largest soundstage in the Southeast on 40 acres of land that was bought. And he and his company at the time, Black Hill Studios, had said that they had done the due diligence and the reports and reported that the land was ready to build on. So they cleared out all this forest land that they had uh, bought. And then once they cleared it and began to build, they realized that it was swampland. Now, if you had done the due diligence that you said, you would have known that. However, they didn't. They rushed through the paperwork because they're greedy and they don't really care much for the land. Now, after they have overstepped in this way, they then uh, petitioned the Cab County to sell a public park in order for them to build this soundstage. In exchange, they say that they will build a park in this Black neighborhood and name it Michelle Obama Park because they think that our people are stupid and that we'll go for these signifiers as opposed to understanding the impact that having trees and forests have on our entire environment. So that's one part of the fight. Now you have Stop Cup City that most people know about, where this place that was originally uh, Muskogee land uh, that was then made into a slave plantation that was then made into what was called the Atlanta Prison Farm, where people were picked up for petty offenses, like being drunk in public, being poor in public, loitering, of course, uh, and all of these things where Black men were arrested for petty crimes and then made to work on this land for no money post-slavery, mind you, uh, in order to provide food for the rest of the prison system of Atlanta. Uh, and for context, when Kwame Ture, also known as Stokely Carmichael, was arrested for protesting in Atlanta, he was held at the Atlanta prison farm. And the only reason why uh, this prison farm was ever shut down in the 1990s is because so many people came in that had been poisoned from the water there. Uh, and there were folks that had died. So, this is the background for them now building the largest police training facility in North America on this same plot of land. When Atlanta has about the 19th largest police force, as we've seen in some of their documents, 57% of the people that will be training in this facility will actually be from the state of Georgia. 43% of them will be from outside of the state. And then in addition to that, uh, we already have what's called GILI, which is the Georgia International Law Enforcement Exchange where uh, uh, Atlanta police uh, travel to Israel and uh, the Israeli Defense Force travels to Atlanta so that they can practice different tactics for crowd control. Now, this cannot be separated from the flag. The fact that Atlanta is the blackest major city in the country, and it's also the uh, most surveilled city in the country because of the 2017 implementation, implementation of Operation Shield. Uh, now, all of these things, this police training facility, as well as uh, Operation Shield, is being done by the Atlanta Police Foundation, which is essentially a booster club for uh, the Atlanta Police Department, where there's absolutely no public check on the money that goes into the police department. And so it's, it's dark money from corporations that's going into policing that's uh, further militarizing as well as surveilling our people. And this is holy time to being able to extract as much profit as possible from folks that don't have the agency to fight back because of the uh, ingrained imbalance and power in capitalism. In 2022, okay, the top 1% globally earned 26, excuse me, earned $26 trillion in new wealth while the bottom 99% got $16 trillion in new wealth. We're seeing a constant squeeze on people that are actually working to make money. And in order to keep this, essentially, we're dealing with the paranoiac responses of the richest people in the country to really enforce these laws because, quite frankly, people are fed up. Uh, Atlanta, although it's called the Black Mecca 
in a lot of cases uh, throughout the United States, uh, has the largest racial wealth income gap of has the largest racial wealth gap of any major metropolitan area in the city. We also, if Georgia was a country, would have the fourth largest incarcerated population of any country in the world. This this uh, this nation, especially the state, is addicted to cheap black labor. And this reinforces the capitalist system. So when we're fighting back, we're really fighting back against state violence and private interests. And that's why it's so important that we stop Cup City. Uh, thank you so much for that response, Matthew. Uh, yeah, I'm just I'm just stuck on your words. You know, they're intent on extracting as much profit as possible because of the ingrained power and balance of capitalism, right? This is a horrific and really evident manifestation of that and um you know it's it's so evident in this case how and and when to fight back but in a system that so implicitly um controls all other parts of our lives so i think you know you're, you're highlighting a really crucial part of, of your work down there thank you um i'd like to turn it over to Priseda as well um Priseda, uh, uh your perspective on why is environmental work increasingly being criminalized what do you think I, maybe are we waiting for Priscilla's mic to come on or just for some interpretation? What do you say, Dan? Nos escuchas? Hola. Hello. <laughs> ¿Ya? ¿Sí? Yeah. Yes, sí. Bueno. Eh, oh. Aquí en Colombia, pues desde la... Here in Colombia. Españoles, since the Spanish conquest, we saw, we saw a demarcation of how the transitions that we've had were going to be. We, we were told, I love you, Barbara, and you're not responsible for the Spanish that came here to our country. And they say they discovered America, but we know that that's not true. After that, what happened was a, a, great, a great stealing of wealth and a plundering, which continues to today. I don't think it's that different to what uh, Matthew is saying. We live through something that's a lot alike. We have a country that is has a lot of fresh water despite all the environmental extraction and damage we still have a lot of fresh water available we still have riches and wealth in our forests despite that our land was populated after the spanish conquest uh, the first things to be populated were the mountainous regions and the fertile grounds or fertile lands were stripped from us and were colonized. Now big landlords own all the land. That's been one of our biggest issues for, we've, for as long as we've had this long war of over 200 years of conflict. Since the Green Revolution, we've seen the implementation of the green package from the United States, basically a policy that was very clear from the United States to Latin American countries. And we've seen that that has blown up into extractive industries. In 2007, 2008, there was a free trade agreement signed where you can see us Colombians that we can compete with uh, with that deal that was signed. We can't because there is no help for campesinos in Colombia. We don't have access to any education or subsidies. Everything we've done here, we've done by ourselves because the landlords, they help each other, but no one helps us. So when they signed this free trade agreement, we knew that that was going to bring 
multinationals, and that's exactly what happened. The multinationals came, the coca crop and cocaine became kind of multinational. Uh, you know, cocaine was not consumed in Colombia. We were basically uh, wage laborers. Uh, you know, we, we provide the supply, but the demand comes from the United States, Spain, and Europe. And that's where we had a lot of issues. The rural areas in Colombia began to depopulate, and we started to see violence. Extractivism has been clear. Defending a river or defending the Amazon, defending the Colombian massive, is basically, as a social leader, it's basically a death sentence. Here they kill a lot of environmental defenders. They kill a lot of human rights defenders because it's um, more valuable to extract resources than it is to promote community development. It's sad what happens, but here in Colombia, the nexus is, or the connections between the government with the United States government has been basically, the US is the, the, the US basically owns Colombia and they apply their own policy. This is a US policy. They practically say what economic policies have to be implemented and which are not, how are we going to defend ourselves from a country like the United States? But they have, you know, they act like they're the owners of our country and the war on drugs has been implemented without consulting us. Everything's like that. Mining, basically every policy is defined by uh, the United States and Washington. Even education is imposed by uh, foreign powers. So for us, it's been really hard because here we have death sentence applied to us. You know, we get killed. A human rights defender, someone who has to live every day thinking that they might get killed every time they leave their home. They might not see their family. Thank you, Briseida, um, and thank you, Matthew, for um, those really powerful testimonies. Um, yeah, I just want to highlight um, that the, the this idea of the Green Revolution and environmentalism being imposed also from the United States onto countries in Latin America um, after they've come and extracted resources and have polluted the, the rivers and have um, polluted the water and have which have led um, to a lot of environmental uh, defenders uh, being killed. Um, and I think both of you already kind of answered this question um, a little bit, but if you'd like to um, emphasize a little bit more about like how does militarization of your region impact your environmental activism or of others? Um, Matthew, would you like to start? Well, if you notice, uh, when I was giving my initial explanation, I did not speak in first person. Uh, very few things at this point when you have uh, the police and the entire state apparatus arbitrarily charging people with uh, domestic terrorism. Uh, it necessitates that you change how you move and what you say. Um, and, and that is the space that we're in now. We're having to learn how to fight in a very different way. Uh, because for a long time, there was just a very committed core of folks uh, that had been pushing this fight forward. Although we have wide support there were so many people, especially in the Atlantic community, that really didn't know how to plug in. Uh, and there was like a solid uh, group of people, uh, some from outside, some, uh, most uh, within the Atlantic community, activists and organized. Uh, however, what we have 
focused on now is building out a stronger base of support uh, where folks feel comfortable plugging in. What we've realized is we need this to be a mass movement because throughout this time, uh, we had exhausted all of our electoral options at the in the fall of 2021. Uh, we had record amounts of public comment, uh, 70% of which was speaking out against this project. Uh, when we were doing polls of the surrounding neighborhoods, and ordinate amounts of people uh, had not known until we told them. Uh, which had been a major part of this project, secrecy. But when they did, they thought it was outrageous. As a matter of fact, there were quite a few people that I talked to about the shooting range and then the detonation of bombs in their neighborhood on the site already. And many of these people thought this was gang activity, but it was actually the police, right, that were causing these disturbances. So they were uh, creating an environment where people thought that you needed the police because people thought that the disruptions and the uh, danger violence that they were hearing around them was actually gangs. Well, I mean, technically you could make an argument that uh, the police in Atlanta have just become a protection racket. But I say that to say this, uh, what we've seen is a necessity to get more people involved at several levels um, that otherwise would not have thought of themselves as police abolitionists. And we're having to make the case very clear uh, and really go line by line, because what people find is when we start to explain all of the constituent parts of these projects, uh, we start to uncover a lot of the mythology that they hold around policing as police being the good guys and not fully understanding how deeply militarized they have become and where all of this money is going. Uh, for instance, in, in the United States with the 60% of the assets of the uh, Pentagon budget can't be accounted for. 60%, right? Only 40%, they can account for where the money goes, right? And many of these surpluses end up going to local police departments. That's one thing. Uh, and, you know, so this, like, militarization has been happening for a very long time. Uh, and so we're having to get a little bit more crafty about the ways that we move and tactically and also how we're viewed by uh, the wider public, because especially in the Atlanta context, so many things are controlled by the corporation, especially the media. Uh, for instance, the main newspaper in Atlanta, the Atlanta Journal Constitution is owned by Cox Enterprises, which is a media as well as several other different business line conglomerates. Uh, it's old money in Atlanta. Now, the CEO of Cox Enterprises, Alex Taylor, is also the chief fundraiser for this militarized police training facility. And we have to cajole the AJC simply to put a caveat when they're writing about Cop City to remind people that they are owned by the people that are fundraising for Cop City and that have funded Cop City. And then their family foundation, Cox Foundation, has also put about $15 million behind this project. And so, I mean, so we're looking at webs of, um, webs of you know, corruption and militarization and having to make this case to the wider public, because quite frankly, we don't have the guns uh, to push back. Uh, so when I was hearing Briseida like really talk about the situation in Colombia, it struck me because in some ways, um, there are certain concerns that we are only starting to grow because I believe that a lot of the folks that we worked with uh, were operating in a way that was predicated on the police and the state following some sort of rules, which we've only now realized that they damn sure won't, right? And it seems as if our comrades in Colombia have been living in this reality for much longer. So in that way, there are many things that we're going to have to learn very fast. And I'm very thankful uh, for our network of indigenous organizers from all around the country uh, that have been willing to support and to care for us as we continue to build and adapt in a way uh, that many people didn't think would be necessary. Uh,
Thank you, Matthew, and thanks so much for um, making that connection um, to Colombia. I think there is a lot um, in the U.S. that we need to learn about what our government is exporting abroad in terms of militarizing communities abroad, um, just the same way that it has been doing here in the U.S. and unite those struggles. I think that's super important. Um, but you say that, uh, is there anything else that you would like to add in terms of um, how you see um, militarization in your community and how it impacts your work? Eh, bueno. So, you know, the regimes that work closely hand in hand, our country, what we've seen for years is, is links. They say there's been self-defense forces or paramilitaries that, you know, we know were, were paramilitaries. And when we went to investigate, and now with the special jurisdiction for peace, with the peace accords, we saw that what we all have been saying, campesinos, black and indigenous communities have said, the alliances between the army with the paramilitaries in Colombia. So basically, that's been latent that our military forces are dark forces. We've said that there is no, there's no black eagles. There's white eagles that in the day they're white and at night they're dark or black eagles. We knew that it was the army all along. And the police and the intelligence services have always been forces that have worked more to protect that they do this unconstitutionally because an army is supposed to protect the people and protect the borders of the country against other states, but not to kill its own people. But here, that's what it's been like. You know, the killing of the UP party has been a nexus between the police and the military. It has been really difficult because living with the army in our territory is knowing that during the day there's an army, but during the night they're a dark force. And right now there's a great transition, but it still continues in our territory. We see paramilitaries working with the army, and we know that the army is trying to get the, the community involved, even children involved, to try and get them to serve their own interests. And what are what do we see? We see an alliance between Congress people, mayors, people who are still working for the multinationals and their interests. So what they protect is capital and the wealth that's being extracted. Having rivers, it depends on us being having a hydroelectric dam that produces energy, but not for us. We live without electricity, basically, because we're not included. But they sell the energy to other countries at subpar prices. But for us, we have to pay high prices for our energy. The same thing with the gold mining. Everything has to do with mineral extraction. You know, we put the dead bodies and we see the same thing with the drug war. We put the, the dead bodies, our people are killed and displaced, killing our uh, environment, but we don't keep the wealth. That's always accumulated by the political elite, not 
as a legitimate government that defends the people, but that are they they bend the knee to foreign powers that basically govern our country. For us, it's very sad, but we don't we don't feel taken care of, even though we're seeing a transition to a new government. We had great expectations, but it's very difficult. We need a long process. A country that has seen 200 years of extractivism, of politics of death and extermination. It's not easy for a government that's only there for, for four years can transform all of that in an instant because we don't have an attorney general that's on board. We don't have a, a coalition in Congress that's strong enough. We have politicians that have replaced narco trafficking and are now in charge of the drug trade. So for us, it's very frustrating having the army and the militarization of our communities. We do not feel taken care of. We feel afraid. And we know in our territories that all the violence that happens happens because of the military. This government says they want a military that saves lives, but that's a big challenge. The new president is trying to tell the military to comply with the constitution, but it's many years that uh, they've been been serving interests that violate human rights. That's a doctrine that the US has imposed. And it's not gonna be easy to take out of their mind the idea that the people are the enemy and that the elites are their friends. Thank you so much for that response, Briseida. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm still thinking about what you've just shared about how um, even with a mythology of capitalism, um, you know, benefiting everyone in trickle down kind of way, the immediate material reality for your community, for example, you bring up the um, the hydropower dams, that, that energy doesn't go to your community as you've just shared, right? So even if for a moment we could somehow excuse extraction and extractivism at that scale, we it, it is immediately clear who it benefits and who it serves. And I think that's so true. Too, for, for in Matthew's case as well, right? We're looking at the destruction of the Atlanta forest to build, you know, this massive, essentially playground for race, racist policing and black and brown people in America. And I think the world over probably know that this does not make their community safer and makes them much worse off. Um, so thank you so much for that perspective. I'd like to move on to another question, um, which has been touched on, but I'm wondering, um, to if, if there's anything we would like to add. Um, so what are political, what are the political or economic interests that are behind the aggression against the work you are doing? What are the political or economic interests behind the aggression against the work you're doing? Um, we can start with Matthew again, if you're ready. Once again, I would like to steal some thoughts from Lisa Ida. Uh, when you are explaining how although you have your people in government offices that it's run by the United States, uh, very much we feel uh, a similar situation being Black Americans in a city uh, whose largest population of any group is Black And you have had 50 years of Black mayors in the city, yet still, you end up with the largest racial wealth income gap of any major city in the United States, you really have to start to question who these mayors are serving, right? Because it's certainly not the interest of their African-American constituents. And it's just so painful because so many of us uh, are so excited to see 
uh, faces of our own people in high places, and yet we are continually betrayed. The same thing that we felt with Barack Obama by 2016. You know, this Barack Obama was from Chicago, and it had astronomical rates of uh, murders, um, of black men murdered, yet nothing was done about it. Uh, so, so that's just something that I wanted to make sure that I touched on. And what we have to see is that when we're looking at the incarcerated population of, uh, of Georgia in general, once again, I would like to state the statistic because it's very important. If Georgia were a country in and of itself, it would have the fourth largest incarcerated population of any nation in the world, just right here in Georgia. And this is because once again, the state is addicted to cheap black labor. And also uh, since the you know, labor movements of the 70s were just drained of their economic power, there was never reinvestment in our communities to build for themselves. So essentially, you had lots of white private interests siphoning off uh, the best of black and brown folks for their own interests. And then with you know, everybody scrambling uh, just to you know, support themselves, the idea of building among communities just seemed so infeasible. Uh, and so you have uh, a handful of African-Americans that do very well for themselves in Atlanta. Uh, and in the vast majority of cases, it's because uh, they just solely looked out for themselves. Um, and, you know, I, I, I like to stay away from crabs in the bucket language because it's more so crabs in a, in a, in a boil, right? It's people just scrambling, just trying to make their own way out. And they're not really concerned with everybody else out around. Them. It's not out of spite that we're pulling each other down. It's because people are solely trying to save themselves. Uh, so, I mean, these are some of the racialized dynamics of the issues that we're dealing with. But also, Atlanta has tons of corporations coming in and they sell out their own public in order to do so. You have Microsoft that's building a 90 acre campus uh, in Bankhead, right? A very black area of Atlanta. You have, uh, Atlanta is ranked sixth among states for Fortune 500 companies headquartered right here. And it's because uh, the taxes are so low that it really doesn't benefit any of the people. And many of uh, the people that they're hiring, they are importing from other states. So whereas they would call a lot of the people that were arrested uh, from out of state as domestic terrorist outside agitators, I'd argue that a lot of these com corporations are outside agitators because they're damn sure not serving the people that are indigenous to Atlanta. Uh, so what you're having is people continually coming in to siphon resources and space in this, you know, hip, cool city of Atlanta and betraying the people that have made it hip and cool, right? Uh, it's kind of surreal to see all these people, you know, tout African-American music or rap. Meanwhile, they're enforcing harsher and harsher sentences on young black kids for even affiliation with the gang. When most of our uh, music culture is predicated on these same ideas. Right. So it's there's so many of our folks that are set up to fail and end up living in prisons where they're just cheap labor for corporate interests at best, uh, if not dead, as uh, many of our folks have been. So I, this is business as usual. And uh, there's just more and more space being made for white, uh, young, affluent people to move in and take jobs that we have never set up the young black kids that grew up in Atlanta for. And there's been no infrastructure to do that at the same time that we're living in a very uh, white conservative state that's trying to erase anything that makes young white kids feel uncomfortable about uh, historical racism and how it is that they ended up uh, having so much more wealth than their black counterparts and the blackest city in America, right? We don't have the agency to dictate our own curriculum about black people. So 
once again to Briseida's uh, point in regard to the need for uh, better education and the means to educate our people. Uh, and all of these things are very much tied uh, to the interests of corporations that are trying to essentially erase uh, Black people off the face of the earth and having any agency except serving their interests when folks are really talented. Thank you so much for that. You, yeah, you've you've really eloquently drawn that tie between racial policing and, and racial capitalism and how it's already begun to, to transform the face of your city there in Atlanta. Um, so thank you so much for that, Matthew. Um, uh, Briseida, uh, if you'd like to respond to this question as well, I'll just repeat it for you. Um, what are the political or economic interests that are behind the aggression against the work that you're doing? Bueno. What I am hearing from Matthew is what they're living through is what we live through. Very similar extractivist policies. I think it's designed from the United States, designed for the entire continent. It doesn't change one bit. What he says is that they don't have media outlets. They also don't have any media outlets. Here, the media outlets are controlled by those who own this country. Ardila Lule, the family, and Santo Domingo family. They own every single media outlet in Colombia. The land is the same. Those two families own most of the land. It changed a bit because in the time of Pablo Escobar and Gacha, you know, these people made some agreements for the policy of justice and peace. So they gave some land up. And some of the land became part of the, became owned by the political class. So those are the famous size, but it's basically the same thing. The land is distributed by the same few families, like the Santo Domingo family. Very sad to see that we see the same practices in different places, extracting water, land. For us, land is life. For them, land is just business. It's just money. That's what they basically just see a business. But for us, it's not like that. For us, it's our territory is our own life. For us, it's not an extractive business. For indigenous and campesinos and black communities, it's a way to resist and exist in our own territory. Because if we don't care for our mother earth, there will be no life. There will be no money that is useful if there's no water. We won't even have air to breathe, oxygen that is actually pure. And what we want, and I think, Michael, I think we have the same thought around education. Since we know there's an education, since we know we have a sick education that has been imposed, we want an education, but an education that is allows us to think critically, not to obey. Because here they impose an education to obey others, not to think. So we want an education that's why we've been fighting for education for peasants from the theory, but also practice. And that's been one of the debates that we have. One of our comrades that was working with us in that proposal, they threatened him and he had to leave. Those of us who have been struggling for education, we have death threats every couple of weeks because it's very easy to make war because they don't put their kids to the war. Their kids don't die in the war. 
they have their own development, supposedly, of death. And those who go to war are our children, because it's our children who are uneducated and they're easy prey. And that's something that we realize is that we have to build an education that is our own, where our children, we can take them to the river and show them how much value does this river have or this mountain or this earth, but not in pesos, but in terms of life and sustenance. That's not what elites want. And they don't forgive us for that because they have the land and they have the ecosystem for them is to produce money, not to produce life. Thanks so much, uh, Briseida. Um, and that ties very uh, nicely to our next question. Um, educate, as you mentioned, education as a form of resistance. Um, is there any other forms of resistance um, against this violence um, from uh, multinationals, from paramilitaries that you're, you and your community are currently practicing? Um, and this, yeah, this question is also for you, Matthew. Um, in, in your community, what forms of resistance? I know that you mentioned that um, you are having to find creative ways uh, of resisting. Um, would you like to share some of these uh, practices and forms of resistance that uh, you all are uh, practicing? Thanks. Well, yes, as I said, uh, what's really worked in regard to, to stopping the construction of these projects uh, since September of 2021 is direct action in many facets. So that's been people uh, occupying the forest. Uh, that has uh, been people allegedly uh, destroying equipment. Who knows how it happened? All I know is that there were lots of tools that would have otherwise been used to destroy a forest that have found themselves sabotaged. Uh, and despite us going through all of these democratic processes, it's only been these things that have been most effective and really just trying to get the word out. Now, one of the major concerns that we have is the whole world's on fire. So, so many of our folks are fatigued at the same time that they're being squeezed, that they're just trying to make it day to day. So the fatigue of people to take on such a struggle that's so all consuming uh, in regards to the labor that it takes in order to sustain it, right? Like occupations take heavy work in order to sustain. Like that can be uh, tough for a lot of folks. So there are other ways to plug in. And that comes down to uh, calling up uh, the commissioners, uh, the city council people, the mayor, uh, and anybody else who has agency in regards to the legislative process, the zoning and the approval process, but also making sure that we're dogging the hell out of any contractor that associates themselves with these projects, right? Like there's this uh, you know, general idea that rich people have ingrained in our heads that everything's just business. And then at the end of the day, after they've made decisions to destroy several people's neighborhoods and ways of life, they should just be able to go home and have peace. Well, we can't, so neither can you. And so we've had lots of people that have been showing up to folks' houses, showing up to people's offices. If you're a contractor and this is not your only project, then we're popping up at your other projects. And so these are the ways that people have gotten very involved in making sure that at a certain point that a lot of contractors decide Cop City isn't worth their time. Because what the Atlanta Police Foundation doesn't do is build. So uh, despite all the things that they might do to raise money uh, in order to, you know, create this militarized police training facility, they don't have a staff of builders or people that can create these things. So those people that specialize in different facets of this project, we need to uh, make it clear that 
this isn't worth their time. So if that means making calls, if that means showing up to other work sites, whatever we have to do to make sure that these people realize that Cup City is not worth their time and uh, the destruction of their reputation by associating themselves with it. Uh, also, uh, you know, but stay tuned. Uh, that's, that's all I'll say. We do have our week of action uh, coming up uh, March 4th through 11th here in Atlanta, and we're setting up infrastructure among many players, and we have to uh, really, my uh, heart and words go out to the students that have really been showing up uh, when it comes to the Atlanta University Center, Morehouse, Spellman, Clark, these students have been standing up in ways that are very, are uh, very difficult at these private institutions. Same thing at Emory and GSU. Anybody else who wants to pop up, please do. We have a lot of uh, support from the faith community. We've had a lot of support from just uh, other folks and uh, everybody in the media that's been supporting us. God knows we appreciate it. Uh, the Daily Show that's supposed to be satire gave us the fairest, and most honest coverage that I've seen of any major media out. What does that say? So, I mean, all of these things make a really big difference. And we thank everybody that's supporting it. God knows we do that. Um, thanks, Matthew. Um, what do you say that? Would you uh, like to add uh, a little bit more about the different ways that um, in Colombia you, you and your community are practicing resistance against all of this that you guys have going against you. In Colombia, we've seen a lot of resistance. We, we thank every struggle. And we've seen struggles that have been going on for a long time, like the peasant struggle, or the great transformations that have been led by indigenous peoples who have been contributing a lot, as well as black communities. And with black communities, the landowners enslaved them and began to enclose them after, and now they are workers on the same plantations. And so, the, and so sometimes they identify with the company that employs them and you think that's sad because they work for these same people who are displacing them. But we see that there's a strong level of organization. We've organized ourselves as peasants, as campesinos, even though it's not easy. A lot of people have been killed. A lot of people have been displaced. But the resistance uh, continues. After what we lived through 40 plus years of uh, a war with the FARC, now we see a negotiation with the ELN, another guerrilla. And the confrontation continues through blocking roads, marching and demanding our rights every day. There's also been people who have had to take up arms. I don't justify it, but honestly, the way that these governments have been so brutal, there hasn't been a lot of options. I was one of the people who was against the FARC, but now, now that I'm a social leader and you have these death threats on you and you have nowhere to go and people are threatening your family, I mean, what else can you do? Because they don't give you an opportunity through democratic means. And now I understand. And now I understand why there's so many armed groups in this country. One, because education as a fundamental pillar is not there as well because 
It's very difficult to defend your land from these forces. The resistance that we've done every day, along with solidarity organizations like you, that continue to visibilize our struggles. Even though you live in different countries with different ways, you feel that we have to continue to struggle together. And for us, that's been a fundamental thing. We also believe that there is an opportunity today, which I see that may be difficult because the Minister of Mining and Energy in Colombia must end or must be transformed. And all the multinationals and media companies have attacked her. She's a woman. So on top of that, it's a young woman that's trying to do this transition and they don't forgive that. The Ministry of the Minister of Health is the same story. And we've had conversations with them because we have to look at what hurts us the most, which is education. But you know, you know, there's a political models that are totally against it. And what this government has not been able to do is to mobilize the media. And what they should have is a media that is for the people. And so everything gets distorted. Everything, the media distorts everything that's going on. And they use the media to terrorize people and infuse fear in people's minds. We don't see things that uh, things have changed since the peace accords. Many things change, but we know that the resistance must continue, that the peasant movement and the indigenous movement has to continue to grow. And that makes us feel accompanied. The collectivity has not disappeared yet. We still resist together, even though the peace agreement, there was a, refle a reflection around the 50 years of war with the FARC. They understood that something that could help resolve the conflict was distribution of land. That didn't happen. And so what people are doing is now resisting and taking land or recovering land that were stolen from peasants and indigenous people by armed groups. They didn't take that peacefully. They took it by force. And so now we've began to recover those lands because there's no other options. Even though the government is talking about distributing land, it's not easy. And we understand that. We began the resistance of recovering land, of re retaking land from landowners, because we understand that we need to protect the water and that our population is growing and we are damaging the environment. And we have to see that if we damage our environment, we won't have water and we'll have to leave our land. And it's not easy because it's land that it's been uh, producing sugar cane for decades, which damages the soil and recovering that is not an easy process, but we know it's not impossible. Thank you so much for that, Briseida. Um, I love how your response is always so rooted in this idea of, of value, right? Like, as you say, not in pesos, but in life. Um, and that's certainly gonna stay with me after this call. Um, so, um, Taking a look at the time, I think now I'd like to invite audience members to send in questions. You can do that either by opening up the Q&A tab there at the bottom of your Zoom screen, um, or if you need to open up with the more option, those three dots, Q&A should be in there if you don't see it below. Um, so you can send in questions that way. You can also raise your hand. Um, 
feel free to um, yeah, direct a question at one or both of our panelists um, and the discussion continues. So we'll continue from here. I think there's somebody with a raised hand, TL Machia. It's not right away visible to me, but if um, but if that's something that you're able to do, um, or maybe Isa. Yes. Um, are you able to to talk? The person that has the raised the raised hand. Seems not to be the case at the moment um, for that person. Sorry, uh, if maybe you can try raising your hand again, or you can go ahead and type it into the Q&A chat. Um, and that invitation is open to all of our participants as well. If you have a question for either of our panelists. Um, if not, uh, I can end on another question um, as well. I just wanna make sure we have that space for audience questions. So give that just another moment. I do see that raised hand now. I am I wonder maybe if there's an issue with like tapping into maybe an interpretation channel or something like that, that is making it hard to hear. So apologies if that's the case, um, we'll make time for that as we continue, or you can of course put it in the Q and A chat. Um, just to continue the conversation while we wait, uh, wait on that, um, a question that uh, I wanted to pose is um, for, for both of you, uh, Matthew and Bruce Ada, which is, you know, if you could, you know, in an instant break through sort of the walls that are built up around mainstream media and share a message, I know there are so many probably, but share a message with uh, the community, with the nation, with the world, what would you make, what, what would you want to make sure people know about, um, about the land defense that you're engaged in? We must hold the line right here. This is the line. This is not one of these times that liberals can convince themselves that the police are our friends and that they're going to use this facility to teach themselves not to be what the police have traditionally been. If you need any evidence of what they're going to do here, Look at what they're doing. They just told you. My friend Tortuguita was killed. They just told you what they're going to do with this land because they're showing you with how they're taking the land. Right? Like, it's not as if you just brutalize protesters that have done no harm to one police officer. It's not as if you're, you, you kill somebody who's a protester and then once you have the land for yourself, you say, huh, maybe we should completely reevaluate the strategy that we've used for policing in the past 300 years in this country. That's not what's going to happen. So now is the important point where we begin to reevaluate how it is that we invest our money as a people in this country. Why is it that we can only seem to find the will to increase money in violence. Any other, if there was any other entity that was able to, to not to show any correlation in the money invested in them and the outcomes as policing is, at the same time that we've raised the police budget more than $38 million in Atlanta, 
the annual homicides have gone from 99 to 170, and now they want more money. That's crazy. And then nobody, people talk about uh, a raise in funding for police uh, when there might be a spike in some form of crime, but have you ever heard them talk about lowering how much they invest in police when crime goes down? No. This is a paranoiac response of people that are extracting as much wealth as possible and their guilty conscience is being projected on us as violent because they know that we should be angrier than we are right now. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you for that. Um, Briseida, to you as well. Um, if, you, if you could broadcast one message from, from the side of your activism, your, your land defense, what would you want to make sure everybody knows? I think it'd be really important that the community understands how important food is and food sovereignty. For us, it's very important to recover our seeds. It's one of our great struggles that we are engaged in. Because many countries depend on GMO corn or GMO soy. All these seeds are now they are monopolized by multinationals. For us, many of our indigenous varieties of potatoes have disappeared. Now we only have three. And that's made us realize that we can't depend on multinationals, that depending on them, uh, it, we must protect our seed to protect our lives. The Monsanto that sells all the chemicals, all the poisons and pesticides, that we don't want to depend on them. For us, that's a resistance. To tell Coca-Cola that, that Coca-Cola is at war with us, so we don't drink Coca-Cola. So we've been resisting that Coca, the coca leaf, is ancestral. And that with coca leaf, you can make the derivatives that are healthy, that are medicinal, that are medicinal. We've changed the policy and saying, showing that we can do it. It's a fundamental thing to understand that agroecology is a very important uh, aspect of our policy. That recovering seeds, growing them with our own hands, for those who profit from GMO seed, won't be in favor of that. For them, that's a big business for them. And we've been resisting that lands that are now, we've liberated them and recovered them through struggle. Now we understand we have to use our own fertilizer and we can make them ourselves. We don't have to buy it from them. That's a form of resistance. For us, the river plays an important role as a supporter of life. So what, does, do, what do we need? Is an education for life, for critical thinking. That means we need more people to be educated, more people that can learn from the river. We can have that education that leaves the four walls of the classroom and can go in and understand everything that they have and everything that can be lost if we continue down this path of endless consumption and capitalism. The pandemic was a fundamental thing. I don't know if in the US was similar, but here in Colombia, we understood that 
rural area, we all had to contribute to the, the, the planet. And we all needed to have in our on our land, we needed something to consume, something to eat. Because if they restricted our mobility, we couldn't eat. And they're throwing so many chemicals on these foods that they're going to kill us. So we, we can't continue to consume Coca-Cola. We can't continue to consume canned foods. We have to start to see our food as a fundamental aspect of our life. It's been very important for us and has been a big challenge that that education is what has made the difference because the Colombian peasantry is not does not have formal studies. Most people have not finished their high school. And university, it's very difficult for us to access that because everything's been privatized. So when they talk about these things, they're complex. And for a lot of people, that leads to a lot of social leaders are not able to tell their story. And they are left like martyrs dead. And that's why I want all of us to unite and show that there's many of us who are resisting. And we think that's a fundamental part that take back what they've taken from us and recover everything that they've taken, not consume what they produce. That will be a catastrophe for them. The economies work if people consume it. So we have to have our own supply. And that for us is very important. Uh, one of the biggest challenges for us is we've had to look everywhere to build a school and to start to make people feel that it's possible. Because when they are uneducated, they feel they can't uh, ask for their rights. But when they are educated, they feel like they can learn and they can learn to struggle. And I think it's important. It's uh, it's a struggle all, for all of us to to take on. Thank you so much, uh, Briseida and Matthew. It's been such an honor, such a pleasure um, to bring you two together for this amazing conversation and make these connections that really connect the struggle across borders. It's not, you know, Briseida said it very well. What what Matthew and um, indigenous and black communities are experiencing here in the US is very similar to what communities are experiencing in Colombia. Um, so it's really important that us as allies um, who are witnessing this, who are um, also here in the belly of the beast, here the people here in the US, the people in Canada, that we really work in solidarity with um, the people on the ground who are actually doing the really hard work of being on the ground, of educating, of um, protecting seeds, of resisting through food sovereignty, through education, through you know your own um, education uh, instead of the one that's been imposed on all of us. Um, so I'm really grateful for your words, for your wisdom. And I hope that we can continue having more conversations like this because it's so important to, to bring people together so we don't feel so alone in the struggle. Um, at Code Pink, I'm, I'm a part of the Latin America team here at Code Pink, and um, we are having um, <clears throat> an event in April um, to talk about these issues um, at one of these really big institutions here uh, in the US at American University, um, we will be holding a forum to talk about the types of policies that we want our government here in the US to be um, crafting um, for a most more just 
um, Latin America, because we understand that a lot of the inequality, a lot of the migration crisis have been created by the US. So we need to actually start fixing those policies. And, and as the two, as, as this year is the 200th anniversary of the Monroe Doctrine, we need to say no more inter intervention in, the, in Latin America and um, let the people of Latin America chart their own paths. We, there are so many more people like Briseida who actually have an idea and a solution. And this is not just from Briseida, but this is from communities and this is from um, centuries of knowledge and wisdom that has been passed down um, of policies that actually um, uh, go along with what, what we need. What we need is like food sovereignty. We need clean air to breathe. We need clean water to drink and that these policies respect our mother earth. Um, so I'm absolutely so grateful for, for your work, Matthew, for your work, Briseida, and for um, everyone here who's been um, with us on this uh, panel. Um, and we'll be sure to uh, put this uh, webinar on YouTube so that everyone can share it and rewatch it. I'm going to rewatch it because it's just like just so so many amazing ideas and and exchanges have happened here. So um, thank you so much. Yeah, I just want to say thank you and farewell as well. Um, Reese Hayden, Matthew, wishing you so much strength, love, and solidarity in your struggles. Um, and and you know your your continued efforts to educate both your own communities and folks like us who are not there on the ground with you. Um, yeah, thank you so much to our interpreter Evan for a really wonderful job interpreting Briseida's responses uh, to Isar host as well. Um, with that uh, concludes our webinar. Um, thank you everyone for attending. Um, and yes, as, Samantha, as, as Sam has said, we will have this recording up on our YouTube to rewatch and to share widely. So thank you everyone so much and have a great evening.